Sure. This is around the half minute point, uh, and uh, just to, well, you've got three debates here, everybody, to to uh, to watch it this evening. So you know, the more here hears and the more shames I hear, the more you're going to be able to keep moving around your seat. Uh, let's bring up the fourth speaker now from the proposition, Mr. Matthew Wilmore. Distinguished members of the jury, honourable gentlemen of the bell, for whom I find my love as rare as any belied with false compare, <laughs> dear francophones of the government, esteemed francophobes of the opposition, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the house, I wish you a very good evening. Now, before I move on to my speech, let's just th think about what we heard from the previous speaker. So he was scared that the enterprises will leave. But as we said in the point of POI, a factory doesn't fit in a suitcase. And furthermore, because the 75% tax was apparently unconstitutional, then that the current plan is to tax enterprise, so all the tax revenue will stay as well. Next, we don't think England is necessarily that great. I'm going to deal with that in my speech. We just think having a head is better than not having a head. And if you think that there aren't any disenfranchised people in France, I would invite side opposition to go on a little walk with me through clichy sous bois and we'll see how that goes for them this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, we have already heard from my honourable partners the view of the millionaires of France. But there remains one group we have not mentioned, those islanders across La Manche, so plentifully represented tonight, into whose country my teammates would be immigrating. As such, I shall imagine no character. I am who I am, an English student dying to return at the end of this year with a little more than memories. As much as I'm looking forward to an actual pint of actual beer, and not just <laughs> 50 centilitres de col, <laughs> I am much more concerned by what I will leave behind. You see, there are a number of things that I've become quite used to, quite fond of, over the course of my last 10 months. Things that I cannot now bear to live without. Things that a mass, mass exodus of French millionaires could help instill within the British psyche. <coughs> Food, style, romance. Three things that we pitifully lack. <laughs> As anyone who has tasted my cooking, seen my wardrobe, or been at the business end of my attempt at flirting will be able to attest. <laughs> and I've been here for almost a year. If you'd had the misfortune to meet me the, on my arrival, if this debate had ha happened in September, you would have been even more horrified. I would have been standing before you tonight wearing pajamas, eating chips and crying uncontrollably every time a girl walked into the room. And I certainly wouldn't have been comfortable quoting Shakespeare to our wondrous bellboy tonight. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, it has been almost a millennium since our last French invasion. And we are in need of a little bit of a top-up. <laughs> 53 years before the big anniversary, an early birthday present, if you will. Of course, yes, the influence was lasting. We, didn't, we kept using French until 1731 in our courts. But look what's happening to us now. We're going a bit American. <laughs> it's now all about suffocating customer service and being carted through malls by poxy little acne-ridden teenagers insisting that we have a nice day now <laughs> and adopting that awful American trend of using air quotes. <laughs> you see, <laughs> our food is getting worse, our people are getting fatter, and our cars are getting bigger. <laughs> Where once we understood the Proustian Madeleine, now our only dessert-based cultural reference is an American pie. We, we are truly at sea. And we are increasingly drifting from Europe. We are so blinkered by the supposed glamour of the world's largest motorway junction, otherwise known as Los Angeles, that we have forgotten the real meaning of style. We need that European tether to support that European project. Side opposition want to talk about. Yes, please it do. It seems, looking at my English teammates, that our deficit in romance is not a function of a lack of French education, but rather an unfortunate biological fact. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I assure you, you are all lovely. And perhaps the Prime Minister's like excited POI at Briney's talk about French lingerie probably suggests that maybe you do need that like, you know, schooling in how to romance the French. Because <laughs> France, give us your rich, huddled masses yearning to be free. See them as cultural missionaries, reclaiming that island and reshaping it into the way it could be, I implore you. Sure, the millionaires might be you know, pretentious and haughty, but what happens in Kensington and Chelsea soon reverberates outwards. From a single Café de Bobo in Sloan Square to a patisserie on every high street, we are obsessed with the rich, our media follows them around, goggle-eyed and drooling, telling the less fortunate to emulate and idolise the lives of those less well-endowed with inheritance. We can use our American imported materialism and slavish obsession with the wealthy to export through cheap reality TV shows the principles of the Republic. Not liberté, égalité, fraternité, but cooking, kissing, and clothing. Three things we always make sloppy. We need these millionaires. We need their demand for decent food. We need their young people to teach our young people how to kiss. We need to indoctrinate a generation into abandoning their slobbish ways. And then maybe, just maybe, <laughs> I'll be able to find a confit de canard in Yorkshire. Thank you very much. Thank you.